passage, um, it says, in conclusion, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I just want to share with you a thought um, this afternoon, and that is life has a meaning. I know it sounds obvious, but uh, there's truth in that. Life has a purpose. I'm sure you all know Richard Dawkins. He made a statement. You know how he really goes on and on and very intelligent guy. He makes a statement. He's actually from your country. Yeah. So <laughs> he makes a statement and he says, we have observed in the universe that there is no design, there is no purpose. He's a doctor, he has a PhD. There is no meaning. There is no evil. There is no good. But pitiless, blind indifference. That's a mouthful. I mean, at the end, you put a full stop. You don't even need to put a full stop. That's the end, even if you don't put a full stop. That's it. Let's pack and go. And he crisscrosses the country, actually the continent, sharing that message. He has found meaning in telling people that there's no meaning. Because that keeps him going. It makes him to study. It makes him to research. It wakes him up in the morning. So it has become his meaning, his purpose in life, is to tell people that there is no purpose. And the question is, what does it matter? If you don't tell them, so what? What difference will it, will it do? We all end in a big hole, dark hole, with no end. So what does it matter for you to be wasting your time in telling people that there is no meaning to life? What? I mean, it doesn't matter. Um, if you say there is no evil, there is no good, somewhere he, uh, in, in God uh, 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 Delusion, his best-selling book, um, he, um, went places describing who God is. That is a misogynist, is a cruel God, is a sadist, sadistic, is, is this, is that. And then, but the point he was trying to make was that he doesn't exist. <laughs> He's so angry at this God who does not exist. And he wants the whole world to know that God does not exist and is a cruel God. Why are you angry at a being that does not exist? <laughs> but I think Huxley comes close in, 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 the, in the very uh, uh, space here where he says, and it's like he writes this towards the end of his life. He says, I had a motive. This is the book. The title of the book is Ends and, and, uh, ends and, and Means. I had a motive for not wanting the world to have a meaning. It's like a confession of a dying um, person who had no meaning. Uh, wanting to, uh, I had a motive for not wanting the world to have a meaning. Consequently, I assumed that it had no meaning. And was able without difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. 
So if you start off by assuming and then you do your research, you collaborate and verify your assumption, you support your assumption. That's a poor way of doing research. For myself, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation, sexual and political. So, in other words, um, this whole philosophical narrative that there is no meaning to life actually liberates one, makes you to be free. Politically, sexually, you are free to do whatever you want to do. And a friend of mine, I remember, he's late now, he used to argue that uh, if you are free and there's no responsibility attached to your freedom, that is not freedom. It is free doom. <laughs> that where there's freedom, there must be responsibility. Because your freedom might mean my enslavement. Your freedom might mean my death. Your freedom might mean my injury. So in your freedom, please protect my freedom. But freedom, therefore, must have parameters. You can be free, but you must be told that you cannot do this or that. You know, if Richard Dawkins is angry at a God who is evil, and yet he says in the universe he has observed that there is no evil and no good, how do you arrive at a God who is evil when there is no evil or good in the universe? How can you be angry when you see evil when there is no evil? I mean, if God is evil, fine. The evil, there's no evil. He's just God. You can't be angry. If he's good, so what? There's no good. It doesn't matter. And if it doesn't matter, then shut up. <laughs> I don't know how many of you know Charles Templeton. Charles Templeton used to be in the league of Billy Graham in terms of being a, a Christian evangelist. I mean, he would pack easily 30,000 in a hall to listen to him preach. He was that uh, powerful. But he wrote in 1991, he wrote a book, um, Farewell, Farewell to God, and then My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. Now, here's a point that I need to say to you. Um, I may not find time to really argue it out. If you can accept Christ, you can reject him. It is okay to reject Christ. You see, he can be rejected. It's not impossible. And you don't have to feel guilty as long as you have applied your mind to reject Christ. And people should not persecute you for rejecting Christ. Because rejecting Christ is always an option. When you reject Christ, it doesn't mean you are this very intelligent person. Anybody can do that. You can accept Christ, you can reject him. By the way, Christ has no problem in being rejected. Of course, he's concerned, but he will not kill you for rejecting him. You see, because he's in control, he's not a control freak. You remember, you remember there in, 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 in the Bible, there was this young rich ruler who came to Christ. And he says, Master, what can I do to inherit I'm not moving today. I'm going to stand here right to until the end of the sword. I'm wearing a jacket. I'm going to get so hot and so, so I'm going to be a nice guy. So he says, do you remember? Do you rem uh, or not? He didn't say, do you remember? You're making me say things that I'm not supposed to say. <laughs> so he says, he says, how can I inherit eternal life? Christ says, keep my commandments. You remember the, the story, the dialogue? And then at the end of the dialogue, he leaves. He says, there's no way I'm going to sell everything I have to follow you. Sorry. I want to go to heaven, but if I can't go with my car, then I'm not going. So he leaves. Now, Christ is God, he is powerful. He didn't even try and, and, and curse him or SMS some tragedy or whatever, WhatsApp, whatever bad things that would happen. He didn't. He could have done things. He could have opened the hole so that the guy would just fall in. He didn't. He allowed him to go. Let me tell you something, beloved. And that's, that's to me, is liberating. To know that today I'm preaching in front of you. Tomorrow I can turn my back against God and reject him. That's always a possibility. Here's something I love about loving my wife. I can divorce her. 
That's the beautiful thing. You see, I have a choice every day. I can choose every day I have an opportunity to say, that's it. That's nice. We call it life. That I can make up my mind. I can decide. I can go ahead and, and say something uh, con directly contrary to what I said the previous day. So, Charles Templeton. Now, I'm raising this because there was a lot of arguments that was raised when Charles Templeton wrote this. How could you do that? How could you even ask such questions? How could you even come to such a conclusion? You are demon-possessed. Maybe he was. Even those who were saying he's demon-possessed, maybe they were also demon-possessed. You shouldn't say a person is demon-possessed if you also are not demon-possessed. <laughs> this is what he says in his book. Uh, somewhere he says, he... I don't see any God of love. All I see are children suffering and dying. I see people killing and stealing. Disease and death are everywhere. If your God is no longer now his God, <laughs> if your God does exist, he must be a sadistic ogre. He enjoys seeing people suffer. So, he doesn't exist. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a short, uh, short, 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 short route. In other words, if if, if things are so bad, God cannot exist. But that's not a solution. Because even when you have removed him, things continue to be bad. You see, if, if children are dying and are getting sick and there is God, and then you remove God, they still die. You've, you still have to deal with that. Unless you could prove to me that the reason they are dying is because God exists. And then you, did I say I'm not going to move? Then, then you cut off, just for now, you cut off God as the cause. You remove God. And then that's a solution. Now they will leave. But if you are saying this is happening in spite of this, this is happening not because of this. So let me get rid of this. Why do you get rid of something that is not connected to what you have a problem with? Now you have no problem because you have removed God. How are you going to deal with disease and death and killing God? It's still there. So what are you going to do? You have just dealt with one option of trying to explain why there is death and killing. But removing that does not remove the problem you are having. By the way, I... could respond in two ways. I don't want to do that, really. That's not the point. Um, I, could say, I could say to him, I know many Christians wrote and said all kinds of things. I could say to him, yeah, there's evil. There's people die. And the Bible recognizes that. The Bible is like a person who, who, who loses a friend in a car accident. Coming from the care meeting or going to the care meeting. Um, or at the care meeting. And then he loses a friend, and then he says, there's no God. How can I lose a friend? That's a toxic faith. That means all along he had a fake faith. That faith was not based on the Bible, because the Bible does not say your friends will never be involved in an accident. So now that you are experiencing that, you can't blame the Bible. The Bible did not say you will not lose your mother. There's no text that says, if you love your mother, she will live forever. If you love your husband, she, he will live forever. If you love, love your kids, they will live. No child will die. The Bible has not made that. The Bible has not made that statement. So when you experience that, don't blame the Bible. Blame your fake faith. Blame your toxic faith. Your sick faith. So here's a problem, beloved. Some of us are entertaining a sick faith, and then we expect God to subscribe to that sick faith. So when he doesn't, then we drop him. Only to discover that it, from the onset, from the beginning, what you were asserting, even when you were singing in the choir, it was wrong. Even when you were preaching, what you entertained in your mind was wrong. It has not become wrong now because you have come to this conclusion. Now you say, I'm dropping God. But you are dropping a false God. Because the, the God you are dropping never existed to begin with. That is why you are saying it doesn't exist. He never existed. You see, the, the God of the Bible does not enjoy see, seeing people die. He doesn't. Otherwise, if he does, he would not have sent his son to die on the cross. 
You see, he doesn't enjoy that. So when you say, I drop God because there's sickness and death, then you are dropping a fake God. But the question is, which God are you going to embrace? Because you need a God. So who are you going to embrace? Yourself? You think you're going to be a good God if you embrace yourself? Actually, when you drop God, you will discover that by dropping God, you're also dropping yourself. This world is cruel. That's a fact. But how do you deal with that? This world even crucified God. <laughs> you think this world plays? As we say, as we say in some countries, in some accents there in South Africa, this world is not a joke. It's not a joke. So this, there's no joke here. We're not joking here. Things are serious here. Things are serious. This world at one stage, crucified the very God that created it. So you think you're going to escape? Now the sooner you realize that <laughs> there's suffering in this world, the better, because then you are preparing yourself for it. I was telling the, the older folks there yesterday that I ran marathons. I mean, serious marathons. One of the longest marathons that, I've, that I usually run once a year, I haven't done that for the last two or three years, but I think I'm going to do it next year. One of the marathons that we do is around 91 kilometers. I don't know how, how, how long is that in miles. I don't know why you're still using miles. All right, so it's 91. <laughs> 91 kilometers. You run it the whole day, given 12 hours. Um, then you c they cut you off if you don't finish within the given time. Now, here's the thing. When you start off the race early in the morning, around half past five, it's cold, chilly, usually run in winter between Devon and Peter Marisberg. When you start off in the morning, There'll be 20,000 of you. Usually that's the number. 20,000 or less, but there'll be 20,000 of you. And all of you in the race as you start, you know you're going to suffer. You know that. You don't need an evangelist to tell you that. And when you start suffering, you don't blame anyone. <gasps> why am I suffering? Because you're running, honey. That's why you're suffering. <laughs> so you don't need to be philosophical here. You don't need to be theological. Stop being a philosopher. When you run such a long distance, you're going to suffer. Like here, here it is. If you're going to run in this world, if you're going to live in this world, if you're going to live longer, if you're going to live for the next 10, 15, you're going to suffer. You know why? Because you're living. If you don't want to suffer, die. Then that's it. You won't suffer. Now, we may laugh at this, but that's reality. The sooner you realize that, that the friends you have now will not always be there. By the way, Take a selfie of yourself. You'll not always be what you are. And keep it, save it, because you yourself are changing. And stop falling in love with yourself and worshiping yourself because you are worshiping a changing creature. You know, <laughs> I say this to ladies. Enjoy your youthfulness. There's a time when, when you walk past some gentleman, they say, ha, huh, did you see that? I'm not saying that's right, but uh, that's naughty guys who say that. So they, and then they see you pass, they say, wow, sure, there must be a God. All right, so you pass. <laughs> but let me tell you something, enjoy that. A few years from now, the same guys will say, can you just pass quickly? <laughs> yeah. A few years ago, you were attractive. Now you are distracting. Can you please pass quickly? There's something we're looking at. <laughs> it happens in this world. So don't drop God when you've become aged and ugly. That's what happens when you grow. You don't grow to be beautiful. <laughs> you grow to be ugly and aged and you die. It's true. Now the moment you accept that, then you are able to live your life. That hey, there are, there are times that is why you owe it to yourself with your friend, to enjoy life with your friend, to do the best you can for your friend. Be there, support each other. Because 10 years, 20 years from now, she may not be there. I read you a text, and it says, Beloved, be immovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord, in the work of God. In other words, living a life that is pleasing to God. Be immovable. In other words, there are going to be there are going to be situations and factors and elements that are going to force you to be movable. 
that are going to force you to stop, that are going to force you to want to just give up on life. And Paul says, don't do that. He recognizes the, all these issues. I mean, we were in Liverpool yesterday, my first time in Liverpool, and we looked and saw all the, the pictures and the stories and the, everything, the uh, records on the slave thing. I thought I'd read a lot, but there were things that I discovered there that are really, really made me feel very sad. One of those was, basically, I've never seen that part where you see the slaves in the, in the bottom of the, the ship, and the ship is moving, and they, they are tied in the chains, and, and the sea is fighting and roaring outside, and, 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 and the billows, and, and they're in the bottom of the ship, and oh my goodness, that's bad. It's one thing to make them slaves, but the process, you, are, you can't even do that to your animals. No, that was bad. Let me tell you something. A right mind will ask the same, this, this question. Where is God when his creatures are being treated like this? You cannot blame those slaves for turning their backs against God. You can't. The miracle is to continue loving God after that experience. That's a miracle. But not to love God, it's a given. In Germany, not in Germany, uh, the Germans in Namibia got in there and invited the Hereros to come into a church, to come to church, and they said, we're going to have prayer meetings. You see, that's the thing. There's the very same people who are perpetuating these evils. Purport to be Christians. What does, that make, what does that make you feel about God? Especially when you don't know that God. So they are brought into a church, and they, then as they, they say, let's pray, let's close our eyes and pray. You know the story, the genocide of the Hereros? They say, let's close our eyes and pray. And they shot them while they were praying. And this woman tells the story because she survived that. And she says, I learned one thing. That when you pray, you must never close your eyes. You know, when I listened to that, I just saw a tear coming out of my eye. I said, you still pray? I thought you'd say you'd never pray again. He says, no, 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 I'll still pray. But with my eyes open. Beloved, let me tell you something. <clears throat> it is a miracle for such people to continue worshiping God after going through such experiences. It is. But Paul says it can be sustained. He says be immovable. Even when you go through that, be steadfast. Now why does he say that? I'm going to give you uh, I'm going to give you, I was going to give you six reasons, I'm going to give you five reasons, I'm looking at my clock. I'm going to give you five reasons because the sixth one is just involved, it may just take too much time. Uh, I'm going to give you five reasons, thereabout. Why you can, how you can be sustained even in situations where life is so difficult. You don't need to listen to this, you can just record it. You will listen to it one day because you're going to need it. Just record it and sleep, you will need it, I promise you. Either tomorrow or next one, you will need it. If you're going to continue living, unless you're planning to do something this afternoon. How do you live through such experiences? Five reasons. Right there in that text, by the way, that, that, that passage, 1 Corinthians 15, those of you who read, uh, we have read the passage, you will discover that Paul is arguing one, for the historicity of the resurrection of Christ. That the resurrection of Christ is a historical fact. Two, the importance and the signif significance of Christ in our lives today. That's why he makes the conclusion. Because he has established the fact that Christ, that the resurrection is a fact. He has established that. He has also alluded and showed us and argued uh, for, the, for, the, for the meaning and the relevance of resurrection. And then he says, because of that, you can live through life in spite of its disappointments and discouragements. Because there's resurrection. So he's, he's not addressing life in his challenges. He's addressing the next life. He says, you can live this life with all this, with all this pain and, and discouragement. You can live this life. You can, you can be immovable in this life because of your hope for the next life. Now, that's problematic for many. I remember a guy who said to me, Pastor, do you really believe that Christ is going to come, pop out from the heaven? Do you really believe in that story? That's, that's a children's story. When they don't want to sleep, you tell them that story. 
not for Paul and not for us and not for many of us. And then Paul says, first of all, he establishes the fact that there is resurrection. I'm not going to get into that. Um, there was a time where uh, people thought that this whole thing of resurrection is a fake. Now, you see, miracles are difficult because they don't happen every day. That's why they are called miracles. <laughs> and so if you report a miracle that, that does not continue happening, uh, of course, it's not going to be a miracle if it continues happening. Um, then people have a problem accepting that. Let's face it. If resurrection did not happen, if Christ did not rise, rise from the dead, there would be no Christianity. Christianity is based on this one big pillar, that is Christ resurrected. Th that's what separates Christianity from all other religions. You are worshiping a God who died and resurrected. You are worshiping a Savior, your leader, our Savior, our Lord and King who died and resurrected. If he didn't resurrect, then close shop. There's no hope for the new life if he couldn't actually uh, defeat, defeat death. And so, so Paul argues in the beginning passages there that Christ died. He was buried in a tomb. He rose. He was seen. They touched him. He ate. So many 500 witnesses saw. And he says, that's it. It's established. It's a fact. That's how you establish a fact. By bringing witnesses. By, 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 by adducing evidence. People are judged and condemned in court and the judge had never seen them do that, based on evidence. You can't say as you argue, did you see me? <laughs> no, we just have witnesses that saw you. And those witnesses are credible. There's evidence. And so Paul uses that evidence to say Christ did indeed resurrect. All right? And then on that historical fact, then he argues and says, this is the implication of that fact. This is why you must embrace resurrection. Number one, 1 Corinthians 15, 26, death is an enemy. The last enemy that will be destroyed is what? Is death. And then right there, right there, Paul seems to be arguing and defending this God and his character. And he says, you are complaining about death and misery. God regards death as an enemy as well, not as a friend. God does not use death to bring glory to him. God does, does not employ death. Death and God are, are enemies. God has a plan to destroy death. Now, if you destroy God because of death, then death is going to destroy you. Now, but if you embrace God who's going to destroy death, then you stand a chance of witnessing death being destroyed. You see, the assumption, the assumption for many is that God has no problem with death. So kids die, they get into disease, people are enslaved, and they die in, 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 in the transatlantic slave route, whatever. And people, they, they think God has no problem with that. They, they have a problem with God who has no problem with that. But Paul says, God hates death. That death is an enemy. But here's the point, beloved. Christians have, have, have tied themselves into a, into a, a, a quagmire, into a, a corner, into a situation where they are in trouble because we, we have taught that the Bible teaches that death is actually a transport for people to, to heaven. When everywhere you turn around, everywhere you open your eyes, you hear Christians saying that death is fine. Your mother is in heaven. Your mother is praising God in heaven. Relax. This child who was raped and strangled actually has gone to heaven. So God has used the rapist to bring your child to him, to heaven. He's one of the flowers in heaven. He's singing in the choir, but he had to be raped to go and sing before God. Now, when people like Dawkins reject that God, then we cry foul. They have to, because that God does not exist. You see, the God we have says... Death is an enemy and it will be destroyed. You see, that's why Adventists believe that when you die, you're dead. You rest, you're sleeping unconsciously. You are neither in heaven nor in hell for a good reason. Because before you go either way, there must be a determination that's going to be transparent. I'm not going to get into that. So we don't have a God here who enjoys. Because if that is the case, if, if death takes people to heaven, then we must celebrate each time when a person dies because he has gone to a better place. Let's celebrate. Hey, Mary has died. Ooh, she's lucky. She's lucky. 
Because now she's in front of Jesus. She doesn't have to worry about winter and summer. She's lucky because it's always cool there. And yet we don't celebrate. And to crown it, we don't want to go there. We're doing everything not to go there. And when a person goes there, we say, he's gone, but no one wants to go. The Bible says the dead are dead, and they remain and waiting for the coming of Christ. Now, we need to wrap our minds around it. Young people, do yourself a favor. Get to know what the Bible says, because if you don't, you're going to be lost. Do yourself a favor and root yourself in the word of God. I wasn't a Christian for some time. This is not a story about me. And I used to read. My father used to buy, you know the, the, the author the, by the name of James Hadley Chase? How many of you remember that author, James Hadley Chase? It's only those, <laughs> those of us. He, he would read, there's a thick book like this. And remember one of the titles, you find him and I'll kill him. All right. He, <laughs> he would read, it's a thick book like this. He would read it and then as soon as he finishes, and I'll read the book. I mean a thick thing like this. I'll start in the morning. By the time it, the sun sets, I'm done. And I'm look, I don't even eat. I eat as I read. And the day I got serious about Christian, I said, you know what? I think I need to read. And then I started reading. I read the Bible, I don't know how many times, in and out. But there was a time when I gave myself a, 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 a goal. And I went through the Conflict of the Ages series. From Patrick and Paul's all the way to Great Controversy. Just going like, Shh. That helped me a lot. But I got stuck because then I had a goal. You remember I just started the whole journey. Then I said, I'm going to read testimonies to the church from volume one to volume one. Oh, that was tough. I mean, have you, have you seen testimonies to the church? It's like it's not a one story. It's, not, it's like reading a, a dictionary. It's not, it's not. <laughs> You're on this point and then it goes to another one. It's not a narrative. Brother so-and-so, I saw, I said, what are we doing here? I mean, but I told myself, I'm going to go to volume one. I finished volume two, volume three. I'm going to volume, that one, I didn't finish that one, I must confess. I just somewhere I said, ah, ah, hi, hi, hi. That thing doesn't, doesn't come together. All I'm trying to say, beloved, I know we're living in the time of media and stuff like this, all little things, uh, short things where you just write short messages, SMS, and short, 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 short. Please go read. Take time and read. I don't care whether you read from Kindle or whatever, but just read. Just read. You owe it to yourself. One day you're going to have kids. They're going to ask you questions. You won't be able to answer because they're not reading. And they will be disappointed because they have a father who can't answer questions. Number two, not only is death an enemy, there's more to life than just eating and drinking. Come on, guys. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32, he says, if the dead do not rise, if the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. That's what he says. If there is no resurrection, then life has no meaning. Let's just eat. Stop going around telling people there's no meaning. Just eat. If you go around telling them, then you're afraid that maybe there is meaning. If there is no meaning, just eat and drink and die. There's a, there's a say in my language when we talk about this hedonistic way of living. So what we mean by that is, that's a heavenly language, by the way. What we mean by that is, <laughs> what we mean by that is you came, you ate, you were satisfied, and you died. You know, it's simple. So you know how to speak Tosa. That cannot be the meaning of life. Listen, beloved, when we bury you, because we will one day, when we put you in a casket, we cannot just say, yay, she ate, man. Yay, she ate. That can't be. It can't be. It can't sum up your life. You cannot be summed up in how many loaves you ate. No, no. There has to be something in the eating. I eat to achieve a purpose, but my purpose is not to eat. I eat to live, but I don't live to eat. There's a difference. Hey, hey, now eating, if it's the end, then it's bad. If, if all you eat is to eat, if the reason you eat is to eat, that's bad. But when you eat to achieve, then eating is a fuel. 
Now you're going to be corrupt if you start eating. If you live to eat, you're going to be corrupt. You think you're here to eat. You want to eat what you're supposed to eat and eat what others are supposed to eat. That's corruption. Start stealing, doing things. It's terrible. You never want to be enslaved by yourself because people are cruel. And you can be cruel to yourself. I've seen people killing themselves. People are cruel. The heart is deceitful. It can even attack its owner. Give it to God. Then you are safe. Then he continues to say, in verse 34, stop sinning. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. Now this is very important because most of the people who have a problem with God then go on and sin and kill themselves in the process. But the wages of sin is death. And here's the thing. Once you drop, once you drop God, You've got to find death attractive. Not only will you kill yourself, you'll enjoy killing others. It is only when God exists that you will actually move away from anything that is opposed to life. You see, Christ says in John 10, 10, I've come that I might have life and have it abundantly. One of the things that happen when you give yourself to Christ is you begin to have an appetite for living. Christ injects this appetite for living. You just love life. When you walk with God. But the moment you drop God, it's like a little kid. Have you seen kids? I mean, I, 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 I observe my little boys. I said they want to kill themselves. I mean, at every turn, at every corner, these guys want to kill themselves. It's either they are putting their things in the, in, the, in the electrical socket. They just want to kill themselves. Or they are eating cockroaches, whatever that's crawling. We, we have to watch them. Otherwise, they are just suicidal. They are doing things to kill themselves. Before you realize they are carrying a knife, oh, drop that knife. You know they are going to kill themselves with a the knife. They just want to kill them. Sometimes that's how we act. God has to keep saying, drop that. Leave that. Leave that boyfriend. He's going to kill you. We just love to be in a situation where we are going to be killed. Sometimes we even sponsor our own destruction. Come, I'll pay for you to kill me. Now you think I'm lying? Okay. Do you know Samson? Do you know Samson? Don't worry. He doesn't know you also. Now, <laughs> in the book of Judges, Samson sits with Delilah. You remember the story? And Delilah says, tell me where your strength is, the secret of your strength. Samson is not going to tell you. He said, there's no way I'm going to tell you that. That's my secret. That's why I'm not going to tell you. It's a secret. So, so. She says, he says, ah, if you tie me with new robes, I, I'm finished. Ah, I'm finished. Nice behaving like an African now. That's not true. <laughs> and, then, and then the woman tries that. The woman tries that. And then, and, then, and then the Philistines come to test if this is true. You see, you have to test truth. So to test if this is true. So the guy just wakes up. <laughs> the woman says, but you lied to me. You know, in that romantic voice, you lied to me. <laughs> How could you lie to me? Samson says, okay, this woman wants to kill me <laughs> in a romantic way. All right, so, <laughs> so, so she says, so he says this, and then ultimately he says, you know what, honey, I think that, that has been unfair for me to be lying. I'm going to tell you the truth because I know you love me. That's why you want to kill me. <laughs> but Samson knew that this woman wants to kill him because each time she wakes up, there are Philistines who are, who are there to, to, to kill him. And then he has to defend himself. Then he, he should have known if he didn't that I'm going to be killed here. That's why this woman wants to know the secret of my strength. You know what he does? He says, if you cut my hair, I'm finished. I know you want to kill me, but at least you love me. It's okay for you to kill me. You know, when you are so sick that you even encourage a person to kill you in the name of love, then you need to be dropped. You need to be dropped. There's something wrong with you. And the woman does, did exactly that. Poof. And Samson, before long, he had no eyes. And before long, he was there pulling this whole thing as a donkey. What happened? Listen, beloved. You do not, just because the person has a sweet voice, allow him to kill you. And the Bible says here, stop. Now, I'm raising this because Moses had an issue with that. He said, I would rather suffer with God's people than enjoy sin for a short space of time. And, and the issue with Moses was not that sin was unpleasant. Do you know that? Do you know that sin is nice? So you have not discovered anything when you say it's nice. If I say to you, 
don't do that. Say, but it's nice. Da, I know. <laughs> da, you don't have to go to school to know that. But it's going to kill you. That's why you should stop it. It doesn't matter how it tastes. It's going to kill you. And, and, and those who drop God cannot therefore define sin. Because you can't. You can only define sin in reference to God. So which means once you drop God, then you, are, you have opened yourself to sin, to destroy, to be destroyed, and to destroy others. So it says, because of resurrection, what must you do? Stop sinning. And how do you do that? Connect with the one who created you. He will give you power and grace to help you to make it. Here's another one. This one is implied in that passage. That if, if, if there is a resurrection, if there is resurrection uh, life is a rehearsal. Think about it. Think about it. If, 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 if there is a resurrection, then all you are doing in life, you are rehearsing. The actual living will take place after this life. So when we meet disappointments, that's why we should not be movable, because this is not the end. When we meet discouragement, that's why we must be steadfast, because this is not the end. You can only have that perspective. You can only have that philosophy when you accept the assumption that the life I have is actually a training ground for the next life. You know those guys who play nicely here, and you guys sing very well, but I didn't say that. You sing very well. You know those guys who play here? Do you know that some of them practice? I know some maybe don't. They've got this in their genes. But mostly people practice. You know, in, when, when you, am I right? When you practice, you make a mistake. What do you do when, when you make a mistake? Do you commit suicide? <laughs> How can I make a mistake? I'd rather kill him. You don't. You just start again. Why? It's a rehearsal. Here's the thing, beloved. This life is a rehearsal. You make mistakes in this life, you start again. Yeah. It's not over. You are young, people. Listen, you are young. You're going to make mistakes. Let me tell you something. It's guaranteed. You're going to make mistakes. You know why you're going to make mistakes? Because we have made mistakes also. It's just that we are too wise now after making those mistakes, and we tell you not to make the mistakes as if we never made them. You're going to make mistakes. But get this, people. Get this right now. Right now that you can always reset and start again. You can. Now, I've seen, I was in Swaziland. I was in Swaziland. Um, we're going to bring this to an end now. I was in Swaziland, and we had a life a program for young people. And then, then we left, and then a week later, I got a message that, you, you remember that young lady who was leading out in the singing? Don't worry, it has nothing to do with you guys. That, that was leading, leading in the singing. They said, they, they said, she committed suicide. I said, but... I spoke to her. I said, yeah, she committed suicide. So all along, while she was leading in the singing, she had issues. Yes, it looks like. And, for some, and I'm not going to tell you what, what, what had happened with, with her life. But she couldn't take it. She couldn't handle it. She said, I'd rather die. Listen, beloved, if only she knew that there's resurrection, that even, even when you end your life, you're still going to be resurrected. It's not the end. In other words, if, if this life is a rehearsal, what it means is here, when I have challenges, let me find the best way to deal with them. Because there's another life. That this, this, this experience I'm going to receive from dealing with these problems will help me live the next life. Listen, if I can make it in the 32 years of my life, how am I going to be given eternity? So if I'm going to have eternity, that means this is a training ground. You don't run away from training and yet you want to do You see, when, 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 when we run these long distances, we train. If you give up on training, you're not going to run. Now, if you give up on this life, you are giving up on the next life because you think this is the only life that, that is. No, it's not. This one is rehearsal. Now, I tell young people everywhere I go, and I'm going to tell to you right now, I'm going to say this to you because you don't hear this often in the church. It's okay to confess when you have done wrong. Some of us are, are carrying guilt. I received a call. I don't know the call. It's a, it's a message from, from a person I know. Uh, she says to me, Pastor, what happens to children who are aborted? I don't have a text for that. I don't have a Bible text. So I don't know. Will they go to heaven? I don't know. But I answered. But then she comes back. I want to know, Pastor, will these children go to heaven? Then I say, I think I'm having a problem right now. This woman is having a serious problem. And I can tell you, if she is so adamant in trying to know what happened to kids, to children, to fetuses that are aborted, she must have committed abortion. Mm. She must 
have committed abortion and she's struggling with that. Let me tell you something. Even as worse as that, you can confess it and you can start again. I promise you, you can confess. You know what we do? Which is terrible. I don't know where we learned that. You know what we do? You've got this big thing in your heart, this guilt, and then says, let me join the choir. Let me join the choir. Hey, choir, choir, choir. Let me join the choir. You're trying to silence the pain inside. Oh, let me be in the pathfinder. Pathfinder, pathfinder. Let's go. Parents, we need your pathfinders here. You're so busy. We say, hey, sit down. No, I can't sit down, pathfinder. I'm not saying everybody who does that has a problem. Are you with me? I'm not saying, but I'm saying we run into activities. Some of us, pastor, they say, you know what? I'm going to New Bold. I, I, I must go to New Bold and do ministry. Why are you doing ministry? He's trying to reach to himself. I'm going to be a pastor. Let me be a pastor. Hallelujah, I love you all. I'm a pastor. What, what's happening? Relax. Sit down. And Christ says in Matthew 11, 28, come to me. Nobody wants to come to him. They run to new board, not to Christ. They run to the choir, not to Christ. They run to marriage and not to Christ. He says, confess your sins. If you confess, you are my child. No father runs away from his child because he has blundered. Now I've got kids. When they started growing up, they were young. Now, no, they've, no, they've not been walking forever because from birth. So, <laughs> so, so you worried, will these kids ever walk? I mean, every parent thinks about that. Am I right? Will these kids ever walk? And then you start reading, when are they supposed to walk? <laughs> then you hear, that one who was born at the same time with your child is walking. <laughs> you say, what's wrong with this child? Come on, walk, man, walk. It's an instruction from your father. Walk. <laughs> but the kid just needed it. He doesn't. And then one day, you turn around. You see this little creature walking. Ba, ba, ba. And you say, oh, honey, he's walking. Then he, like, he, he's hearing you. Then he, like, drops. <laughs> says, walk, he says, show mama, show mama that you can walk. No, oh, come on, walk, walk. Show mama. Huh? He's not walking. <laughs> then, then the wife says, are you sure? <laughs> yes, he did walk. Of course, there were no clips then where you can just have evidence. Look, I have, I, we didn't have such. At least you have that. Then we can keep it. Hey, but I know in my mind this thing can walk, but I saw it walking. <laughs> eh? So I, I have this thing that says he can walk because I saw him walking. Yes, he may not be walking now. There's no parent who runs away from his child because he walked and then he fell. That's the point I'm trying to raise you. When Peter walked on the water, beloved, do you remember? Da! Now, I can swim in the water. I mean, maybe I can a little bit. But, but, I mean, swimming in the water is a skill. Am I right? Some of you are born with that skill, but some of us have to learn. Still, swimming in the water is a skill. But walking is a miracle. You can never be trained to walk on the water. It's a miracle. So, so Peter says, Christ, he sees Christ walking. He says, ah, I can walk also. Can I come and walk? You don't have to stay in the boat. There was no reason for Peter to want to walk. But for some reason, out of curiosity, he says, I want to walk also. Christ says, come. Because I don't want you to go around and say, oh, he walked because he was Christ. You can also walk. I mean, if I walk, you think I'm going to invite you to walk with me? Because I'm not going to be popular after that. You see, if both of us are walking, then, then I'm not going to be that popular. But if I'm the only one who walks in the UK, then that makes me look... Psh, in the chat, I'm there. But if I teach all of you to walk, that's the end of me. So Christ says, you walk also. I don't want people to think that Christ, Christ, walk, walk, walk. You can walk also. Come. So he starts walking. I don't know how long, but he walked, eh? Because the Bible says, and then he started walking. The guy was just walking, maybe for three seconds, I don't know. But it doesn't matter whether it's three seconds or four seconds. It immediately does not lie in the duration. And then he started falling, started sinking. He cried. And Christ lifted him up. And I, I've heard people preach, yeah, even that Peter of yours was trying to walk and he fell. Do you know why Peter fell? My friend, do you know why Peter fell? Because he was walking. You see, people who, who walk run the risk of falling. And lack of faith, you're right. People who walk run the risk of falling. And the reason why your members in your church there where you worship, will say, you know that little girl, that one that leads, the one that is, uh, the, you know, you know what has happened? She has fallen. You know what they are saying? That you were walking. 
And their own little girls have never fallen. You know why? Because they never walk. And I say to you, young people, and I'm telling you this before you fall, but when you fall, now if you fall, we have an advocate. Amen. But that advocate works only for his children. Because remember, it's when my child falls that I, I made it my business to pick him. I don't go around all other homes encouraging ch children to walk. <laughs> so if you are God's child and you fall, God has a provision for that. Amen. He'll pick you up. I'm sure he'll do that. Please listen to me. Don't end your life. That's the beginning. Because those of us who have fallen have learned so much. We have so much to share with those pathfinders. Because now you know what it means to be careless and faithless. Because now you've got the scars to show it. That's the last part and we go. It doesn't end in the grave. You leave that open thing there when the casket goes down, that thing is going to pop up again. That body, if, it, if that person lies in Jesus, it's going to come up again. And when it comes up again, that's when we begin the whole thing. To address even those issues you had about your God was unfair. In the resurrection, we will sit down and deal with those issues. So, you understand Paul when he says, be immovable, be steadfast. It's for this same reason, that there's resurrection. It may not make sense now, but keep it. Life has, it can throw all kinds of curveballs. But I promise you, it is worth living, even when it, when it becomes so difficult. Now, I'm going to pray, and I want to pray for you, and we're going to close. This is what I'm going to do. Some of you are going through some challenges here, whatever it is, whether it's your friend who's going through a challenge, or your parents, or you yourself are going through a challenge. I want to pray for you, but I may, nev <coughs> I may never see you again. I don't want to get to Cape Town, Port Elizabeth, and hear that. You know that person who was sitting there? Uh, committed suicide, and I said, I should have prayed. I should have asked God to give that person strength, and I'm going to do that. I've learned in, in, a, in a hard way, and never to miss that opportunity. I want to pray for you guys. Really, honestly, I want to pray for you. If some of you are going through a situation where you're even beginning to question your own Christian, your own faith, you feel like there are too many questions and ve very few answers. Are you with me? And, and even the answers that come are not very satisfying, and you know, you know this could probably be your last camp meeting. If you don't get answers, you're out of here. I agree with you. That's probably the best thing to do. I don't know. But I'm saying to you, you need God to reveal himself to you. If you're going through challenges, if you're going to situations that nobody else knows, this is it. If you're concerned about your friend or whatever, and you want to stand for your friend right now and say, Lord, please remember my friend. I'm praying for you because she may have disclosed something to you that's very heavy. It's even heavy for you. I want you to do me a favor and do yourself a favor. And just stand up where you are. Come, come to the front here. We're going to pray together. I'm going to pray to God that you, you may be immovable and steadfast. I don't know what challenges you're facing, but I promise you, you can be immovable. You can deal with those challenges. Don't drop God. Because once you drop God, you've lost meaning. You have no reason to live. Don't drop God. Stay with Him. Stay with Him. Even if He doesn't make sense, stay with Him. Stay with Him. He will make sense. He will reveal Himself. Ask Him those difficult questions. Ask Him. I'm not saying don't ask. Challenge Him. Ask Him. Do whatever. But stay with Him. Be immovable. Be steadfast. And God will come through for you. Let's pray together. Our kind and loving Father, here we stand as these young people, full of life, full of hope. But some of us standing right here have experienced difficulties and hardship. And some of us are about to experience hardship and difficulty. But Lord, this life is a rehearsal. We're ready. We're ready for good life. We're ready for bad life. We're ready for nice things. We're ready for bad things. All we ask for, may we be immovable and steadfast. May we never think that what we do for you, how we live as we obey you, is meaningless and vain. 
Help us, Lord. Help that young woman. Help that young gentleman. Help that daughter. Help that son. Help us, Lord, individually. Meet us at our point of need. May we not give up, dear God. Use someone. Bring someone. Reveal yourself. And may this sermon that we have shared in the last few minutes, may it be a breakthrough for some. Or for someone, Lord, who was also wondering whether you care. You do care. This world is enveloped in sin, a disease called sin that makes us not to understand why things work the way they do. But there's a world that's coming. And that world will help us understand what was happening here. May you keep us and sustain us until that day. Faithful. And where we have erred and where we have seen, dear God, please forgive us. Forgive your children. We confess. And I confess on their behalf, Lord, and accept us. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. God bless you.